things of God. Amen. And I, and I notice that God supernaturally is doing something. If you watch the ministry in Nairobi, you will notice that God is giving us huge numbers of young people into salvation. I think even yesterday I saw seven young people got saved. So every Sunday it is a story. And one more thing that has touched my life so much that I've been in the ministry, have been in the ministry for 40 years. <laughs> in actual fact, more than 40 years, actually, more than 40 years. But um, one of the things that have kind of like touched my heart is the, that we, we're in the month of prayer and fasting. This is the month of February. And the people leading the meeting, one of my sons in faith, Minister Hubbard, a brilliant young man, is in charge of, of, of the intercessory and the prayer. But guess what? He has handed it over to the third and the fourth generation of FEM ministry. We thought we knew how to wage war or, or do spiritual warfare. I figured out that I have not even done that. They pray scripture, Pastor, Pastor, Pastor Philip. They know how to quote the scripture. God, didn't you say? Oh, they remind God his covenant. Amen. So for me to see this nice little beautiful babies in the UK, I'm so excited. Amen. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. A happy 2024. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's happy new year. So you can tell I still have my Christmas, yeah? <laughs> when all of you are wearing black, <laughs> I'm in a mood of Christmas. Amen. <laughs> wow. So thank you. Thank you for this wonderful, great service. I want to thank every one of you. Thank you so very much. I thank God for this, the guests who have come from outside this nation. I appreciate every one of you, and I want to appreciate all the ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ from the, all the ministers from land from the UK. Would you all stand, all the ministers from this nation? All of you, please stand. Or you can give them a better God bless your hand. Yeah, yeah, thank you, even out there. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming to the service. Thank you so very much. Hey, we appreciate every one of you. And uh, of course, uh, the ministers from Nairobi, we've already recognized you and all protocols have been done. Thank you, Pastor Hans, so much. You've done a great job. Help me appreciate my son, <laughs> Pastor Hans. <clears throat> you know, today, as I was getting prepared for the service, I don't mean just to, can, can we just make it easy today and have a talk? Today I was, I was kind of, uh, I was preparing for the service. I thought about something. I have very strange sons. Both white boys and black boys, but they are funny. Another time, you see this Pastor Hans you are seeing here? He's a lion. <laughs> this one. So I had one of my sons who was throwing tantrums on me. And... Uh, <laughs> Pastor Hans was sitting there praying, trying to be nice. But he hit the roof and said, can you stop now? Right now. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so it was so interesting. <laughs> then he sends me a message at midnight. Mom, if I, w I was out of control, please, <laughs> please forgive me. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so blessed to have sons. Yeah, appreciate my sons in faith. Yeah. <laughs> They're just like their mother. How many know everything produces after its own kind? Don't try to mess up with me. Don't, you know, you know, you know. I've given you some crazy testimonies. Where, like when they said, "Oh, I, we can have a woman preaching here." I said, "What are you? What are you talking about?" You know, one time they said, oh, we will not have you here preach. I say, you know what? I want you to know everybody will be fired. When I come here to preach, none of you will be holding an office. You don't stop a preacher. For, you don't stop an evangelist. You know, Pastor, my spiritual father, Pastor Bonke, used to say, if they shut the gate, climb the fence. <laughs> Isn't that 
that good? So you can imagine that ugari is the African thing, yeah? It doesn't taste anything, huh? but it's very nice. So ugari comes from unga, the, yeah, so, so, <laughs> so, you can, so you can imagine. Thank you, thank you, Prophet David. You're such an amazing, you're such a blessing. And I thank God that you're my friend. So it's so great, very grateful. You know, Prophet David, you prophesied something. Was it two years ago? I thought, I don't know, the team can remind me because this hit the news just before we came. How many remember, when, would you remember when Prophet David prophesied that we will get them? I don't know what you call that. That is, I don't know if it is chemical, whatever, the stones that they use to make mobile phones. How many remember? And he started, yeah, when was that? You were there? Two years ago. Eh? And then he was trying to say it's going to be in course. And then he was trying to pronounce quare, qua, qua, qua. And then we all said quare. It has been discovered. Yeah. And by the way, our president had one phone, the first phone made in Kenya. Wow, come on, give God a praise. It's so wonderful to have a prophet. Yeah, you know, Prophet David, and I remember some years ago when you prophesied about the highways and the byways, my goodness, God, you know, you come to Kenya, you have no idea. So thank you very much, Prophet David. We'll be sharing the microphone. I want to make it very short because we were going to, I want us to get into a time of talking and a time of, uh, of signs, miracles, and wonders. And I know today God has something for somebody. And God has something for everybody. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Philip, Pastor Rebecca. Yeah, we thank God so much for you. Don't you love this couple here? <laughs> and Pastor Philip is the bigger brother to, uh, to Pastor Simon right there. A uh, great family. And Pastor Rebe we, are so, we love you, we love you. Thank you so much for coming. And thank you for being in Dallas for the ministry. We are just special people. Thank you very much. And we thank God for Apostle Karanja and Pastor Teresa. They are so... You know, I'm so blessed to have sons like these ones. You know, they take me to war. You know, like, like I, the apostle just sent me a message. You know what? I discovered this groundbreaking or something going on in Kenya in the month of March. I'm coming. All right. Help me appreciate this couple there. Help me appreciate them. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Yes. So, um, so allow me more to speak from my heart this evening. I'm sure you're aware that I, I gave a word from the, from, uh, from, uh, in the month of January, and as I was in prayer from October, normally in October, November, I would receive a prophetic word as to where God is taking us as nations and, and as a people. And I would hear the voice of God give me the voice, the word from Nehemiah. And thank you, Pastor, Pastor Hans, and you're going to help me in a, in a question that I'm about to ask you. So, uh, so, so we, we, the theme of 2024 is Nehemiah, the second chapter, and that is uh, mainly, we're measuring on verse number eight, uh, 18, 18b. And they said, mm -hmm. and they said, you know, Apostle was very good in trying to remind us that, uh, that uh, English, though some of us could be a second, third language, that we have to pause when, when it need, we need to pause. You wonder who said what? So who said what? You know, you know Prophet uh, Stephen, you are English, so you can teach us this one. So somebody must have said, because they just, the Bible says, and they said. Meaning those people who said are the people that the Bible is referring to. And I want to remind you that in the days of Nehemiah, as they were saying something, they were hard pressed, they were oppressed. They, didn't, they were not in a good state. They had, they had suffered. They had suffered rejection, bad leadership. They had shepherds who didn't care about them. But a time came and they said, let us arise and build. Today I have come to your beautiful country, into the UK to say, a time has come for UK to say, let us arise 
I have come to Europe to say, a time for Europe to say, let us arise and build. This is the time. So, and the Bible says, and they set their hands to the good work. You know, they didn't just say it, but they acted to it. Allow me to just be very honest as Apostle was taking us through the scriptures. The church people have a problem. We say too much, but too, do too little. But a time has come for us not only to say, but to do it. So these people said it, but they acted. And the Bible says they strengthened their hands for the good work. So a time, time has come and the time is now. So 2024, we've entered into a very interesting season, a season of building. Can I tell you something? I love building. I love building. I am so bad that if there is nothing to be built, I would demolish something so I can build something. I, I just love building. And I, as I was coming, I was thinking, why am I so crazy about buildings? And I remember, I'm also called to build people's lives. So in, in whichever way you look at it, I'm a builder. I'm a builder. God has called me to build people's lives and, and make them look better. But also, on the other hand, uh, in my home, I'm ever demolishing something and building something. So every time I have a side hustle, Every time I have something that, that I'm doing, even apart from the ministry. So we have come into a season of building and rebuilding. I love this word because it takes me back. We're coming from a very difficult season of COVID-19. Some of the effect and some of the damages, some, some of the things that people went through, people are still being restored and people are being healed. A nation like this one, you lost so many lives in the U.S. So many, many people died. And of course, like in Africa, my country, we didn't have those kind of big numbers. We still lost people, but not as much, and not as what people thought. And this thing did not care your status. So people lost things, materials, lives, and everything. So when God says, I want you to rebuild your lives again, what a word, what a word. And during COVID, remember, we were shut down, locked down, done anything that you didn't even know. We had masks on, we had aprons on. We had everything. But having all those kind of things, also people never worked. We were tied, we were shut in the houses, meaning those who are in businesses, they did not have time to rebuild their businesses because people were shut. People, in other words, people spend their savings. So we are coming into a season of walking on the word that God is giving us that I have come that you may rebuild your lives. I have given you a word that you may know there is grace to arise and to build. I wish I have somebody who has a little business somewhere, somebody, because we are about to prophesy to those things that seem to be dying or dead because God said we shall rebuild. How many know that, you know, English, when English talks about rebuilding, it means that maybe it existed before, but somehow something, it was not or robbed from you, or maybe it died. What has died today, there's grace of resurrection. We're going to bring it back. We're going to bring it back because God has given us a word. So I, 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 I noticed something. Apostle Paul, I love Apostle Paul, and, and I think um, I, the, the uh, Apostle Kalanja, they have so much to share with Apostle Paul. <laughs> they are teachers of the word. So uh, Apostle uh, Paul talks in the, in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians, the third chapter. You know, I don't like telling people the verse so they can go and look for it. So Apostle Paul gives us a very good advice. Apostle Paul says, take heed how you build. Take heed how you build. So it means though we are going to build, it means we just can't just start to build. 
we must have a strategy we must have a plan we must know what we are doing i mean i don't want to get into that because that that's not what i want to speak about but we must know what we are building take heed meaning you must carefully know what is this thing that i want to build what am i rebuilding all right Last Sunday uh, in Nairobi, I was uh, speaking. Um, I was speaking during the second Sunday, and uh, and and I said, I, I God, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. Before I start any other construction, God drew me attention to myself. That maybe there are things in my own personal life that I might need to consider to build. Think of it. Maybe I need to think about my personal altar before I start any other construction because here Apostle Paul is saying, saying, take heed how you build. So before I get into the business of building, I don't want to assume or take the grace of God for granted. I want to understand exactly as to what I'm doing. So before we get started with the constructions, I shared about my own personal list, and if you don't mind, can I share with you? I had a personal list that I had uh, actually done so that I can check on a few things that concerns me. I don't know if they will concern you, but personally they have concerned me. First of all, the most important thing I checked, number one, my walk with God. That was the first thing that hit my spirit. How is my walk with God? You know, sometimes we can talk about salvation. That, you know, you, you've been saved for, for 45 years, and, and, and it's good to check, yeah? It's, it's, it's always good to check, yeah? Your walk with God again. It's because, again, in Philippians 2, the Bible talks about, I will work out, Paul says, I will work out my own salvation with fear and trembling. I will work out my own salvation. So I was thinking I need to check about my salvation again. And, and, you know, from the day I believed in Jesus Christ, where am I? Just to have a list to make sure that I take heed on how I'm building. So the second thing I, I, I was rechecking is my love for God. My love for God. Am I just saved or do, so that I don't go to hell? Or, or do I have a, a love for my God? The third thing I was che checking again is my standing in him. What's my standing? Am I standing, right standing, the right standing, yeah? Yeah, I don't, maybe we don't like using uh, righteousness, the right standing, the right standing with God. I, the fourth thing I was checking was meditation. My meditation when it comes to the word of God and in prayer. How is my, how is my walk or when it comes to, to meditation and the word and in prayer? Uh, number, num number five, I was checking my relationship with the fellow Christians. Yeah, yeah. You know, sometimes you think you're just going to heaven by yourself and you don't need anybody else. But uh, we cannot neglect the fellowship of the brethren, all right? So I was checking, what, how, do I, how do I relate with the believers? Well, how do I do this? The sixth thing I was checking was my commitment to his service. What I do for God, do I do it out of love? Or do I do it just because it's a duty? The seventh thing I was checking was my obedience to the will of God. Yes. I checked my obedience to the will of God. Because as a young believer, uh, Prophet David, I, I walked in such obedience. But as Apostle Paul says, take heed. Take heed. Tell your neighbor, if they don't have an attitude, take heed. But if you think they are not okay, just, just, just do like this. Don't tell them anything. So, <laughs> so, so as a young believers, we are always excited because we, we always walk and talk and sing and dance like Jesus is coming in the evening. But when, when it doesn't happen that Jesus doesn't come, sometimes we kind of, we lose obedience. I remember, let me tell you something. 
the grace of God upon my life to walk in the supernatural started with obedience. Yes. Obedience. And that's why yesterday, and, and I noticed Apostle was showing me that he wanted to talk to us about obedience. Because there's no grace without obedience. And you can't receive anything from God. I remember as a young believer, Prophet David, I was so obedient to God when I lost everything in my life and I started my life with nothing. Like nothing, nothing, nothing. I had nothing. I had one dress which I washed in the night so I could wear it during the day. And if that dress was looking like it's not gonna dry, I dried it with a towel, I didn't have a dryer. So I remember when I got so tired of being like homeless, you know, you, you know, sometimes you've got to be sick and tired of something for you to be moved to the next thing. I remember, I think it is in my book, the book Cactus, you know, I, I'll recommend that you read the book of Cactus. Prophet David, I was told there is a certain Bible school that is using it as a manual book in the US. And yeah, yeah they, all their students have been, they're getting, they're getting the book Cactus. One of the things God taught me was obedience. So I remember when I got so tired, can I give you this testimony just before I continue? So, be, so I got so tired, um, I don't have anywhere to stay, I, I don't know what I'm doing, I don't know if I'm going, I don't know if I have come or I'm gone. So every day I'm walking, I can tell anything, poverty, any kind of distress, everything that is bad is facing me. Do you know, I told God, God, ah, uh, I cannot live like this. I need to look for a house. And the Holy Spirit asked me, where do you want to stay? How many know if God asks you something like that and you know it's God, you don't choose an ordinary neighborhood? <laughs> Can we talk? Because this is a good, it's a good talk and I want you to encourage me because this is about faith in God. So I choose a very nice, um, you unusual uh, place. So, and, and I was told, why don't you go and, and get yourself a house? I have no money, I have no nothing, okay? So this is purely God. And I want you to know that sometimes the things of God look like foolishness. Faith is one of the things that can make you look like a fool, like a foolish person. So I remember I went to look for that apartment, for, for an apartment. It was very, they were very, very special, very, very special apartments. Uh, those of you who've come from Kenya, they were uh, Upper Hill. And remember those days, the Upper Hill was one of the highest class to ever stay. There were only diplomats staying there. So I went to look for an apartment. So when I went there, I met the manager. So the manager, I asked, hey, do you have some apartment? Yes, yes, we have some apartments. And he took me around, and I started walking and inspecting. And I say, yes, they asked me, when are you intending to move in? I said, as soon as you are ready for me. <laughs> Remember, I have no money to pay, yeah? So I say, so, so I say, but there are a couple of things. Now I started talking. I started talking the talk. There are a couple of things like that rug, I think is too old. I would suggest you move it and put a new one. I, I, I look, I opened the fridge, it was too old. I say, can you change the fridge and give me a new one? I'm talking like I have it together. <laughs> I don't know whom I'm talking to, but faith. Yeah. I say the word faith. So I talked like I had everything together. So I looked at everything that was. So I said, so when can you change these things? They said, as soon as you are ready for us, we will change. We'll give you what you want. I didn't like the couch and I, I didn't like the mattress on the bed because people had slept on it. So uh, some of those kind of things, you know, you are sensitive to them. So I just needed uh, just like a clean, good beginning. So I'm asked, so, uh, so I was told, so I asked, so, so what is the requirement? They said six months payment and a deposit for two months. I said, that's very easy. So can I come to bank <laughs> tomorrow? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come back tomorrow. So they say goodbye. You know, they even, the manager escorts me because I'm looking like a big shot, yeah? <laughs> You know, because you can't use all those words what needs to be changed. I went home and I told God, God, do you know? You know that you know. I have no money. 
I have nothing. God, you know, I'm homeless. I say, God, this apartment, the reason I like it, is because you and me staying in it. Amen. <laughs> it will look so good on both of us. Because we are moving in with God, so you know. So I, that, I asked God, God, did you hear the way I committed myself about the payments and about tomorrow? That night, that night, in my foolishness, that night, the Lord visited me. And, but listen, if you know the visit, you not even say amen. I was told to go to a certain office, very, very prestigious office, to one of the greatest uh, um, managing director of one of the biggest corporation in Kenya. I was told, go there, I'll meet you there. Go to the seventh floor. My goodness. So I wash my usual cut dress and I organized myself. So in the morning, I was told what time I needed to go. So I went to that office and the secretary looked at me, you know, you know how some funny secretaries, they look at you from, <laughs> from head to toe. Don't try to intimidate me by looks. I also have eyes. So if you look at me, I also look at you. I ca you can never be arrested because you looked at s <laughs> So she looked at me funny. Do you have an appointment? I said, of course I do. If I was asked who I was going to see. But remember here, already God is a part of this house. So we are moving in with him. So the details I don't have, he has them. So I have no problem. So then she said, um, okay, after the gentleman, uh, the two people there, you are next. And I'm saying, God, I thank you that I don't know whom I'm going to see, but you know that person. So I was told, lady, next. I walk into this huge office, red carpet, a huge table. A gentleman said, lady, can I help you? I say, um, yes, sir. Now I was almost getting to a panic. Then he said, can I ask you something? Are you Teresa W. Kenyanjui? I said, yes, I am. Oh, then he said, you just missed one another with your guys. They were here. My heart almost fell. And, 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 I, and I said, oh, okay. But they, they give me your envelope. He took a huge envelope and handed it over to me. Pastor Philip, I gave it away. It was written in gold, ink, my full names. So he said, you are Teresa. They told me to give you that one. I walked, I said, thank you, sir. I walked out. Let me tell you something. Before I walked down, I opened that envelope, six months rent, two months deposit, and nothing else. Oh, come on, somebody. I'm encouraging somebody. Faith in God. So I took that money. There was no tithe. Because you remember now we are in partnership. <laughs> so the one I need to tithe to is also a part of the house. So I went and I, you should have seen me with the envelope. I dropped it like that and I said, sir, would you count and let me know when I'm moving in. <laughs> so, now I even have an attitude, I'm walking a bit taller because I have it together. I don't know, but there's going to be a divine visitation for some people sitting here whom God will surprise. So now, um, so then I lived there and I, and I was thinking now the next thing, I don't know. So I prayed after the six, uh, my rent was over, I prayed again. And guess what? God sent me to the same office. But this time I even had an attitude as I walked there because I knew there was an envelope for me. Then he said, oh, your people again came here. He remembered, 
are you still a tracer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, your people came and you have just missed each other. They just walked out of the door. This is your envelope. They dropped your envelope. Let me tell you something. After that, my dad went. The man hit the roof. He told me, can I ask you something? The th now the, the third one. Does your Arab people think I'm a messenger? <laughs> Tell those Arabs, I'm not a messenger. I'm the director of this. I, did, I say, sir, I don't know any Arab. He said, no, get out, get, get out of my office. The secretary was called and the secretary said, sir, I have never seen any Arab come to your, to your office. Let me tell you something, the angels of God, <laughs> they didn't need a door because my partner in the house is a door. So I thank God. So I built my life through obedience. Many times, like now one time I was told, those of you from Nairobi, to go to Hilton Hotel and to be there at seven o'clock. I think those testimonies are in my book. I don't want to give you too many. Uh, so I'm standing and I was told to stand at the door of a chemist. How many know Kilimanjaro chemists? Those of you who've come from Nairobi. So I'm standing at the door. First of all, I don't know whom I'm waiting. I don't know whom I'm meeting. Somebody comes and says, I can't believe this. God spoke to me last night in a dream that I will meet you here. And guess what? Another need was met. Remember, I didn't have a lot of clothes. I, I, now I, I maybe I have one to change. I remember how many know the Matibas family? Uh, Matibas family. They were great politicians in Kenya. Uh, Mrs. Matiba came to London and she shopped. She called and said she wanted to see me. She brought me three huge suitcases of the clothes that she had shopped here in the UK. And she said, God spoke to me that I bring these clothes to you. They are not mine. But guess what? The reason God sent her is because I had a prophetic guidance for her. So I told her, I need you to sit down. I told her, tonight your home will be attacked. I'm giving you a word because you can choose to stay or you can choose to go. You'll be attacked tonight, and if you stay, you're going to get very dangerous, bad injuries on the head, but you will not die. And as you will be taken to the hospital, I will call you from death, and you will respond. But for your husband, if he stays, he will die. He will be killed. She called her husband. The husband took the last flight to Mombasa, but she stayed. Guess what? I had told her at midnight, the enemy of your soul will attack. Exactly at midnight, the attackers showed up. She was chopped, head everywhere. By the time her neighbor, who happens to be an old English man, they were getting to the house and taking her to the hospital, she had lost so much blood. So, but I told the, one, the sister to Mr. Matiba, I had told her she will not die. So they kept on remembering she will not die. So I remember, they, she remembered that the first thing I would do is to call her. So as she, they were getting her out of the surgery because it was such an emergency surgery. I called her. I called her. I called her. She woke up from the theater straight. And I told her, I remember you and me. We have a covenant and we have a promise. You will not die but live to declare the word of the Lord. She says, yes. And then I said, now, just go back to sleep. I'll, I'll see you another. I'll see you later. I'll talk to you later. She fell asleep. And every doctor was thinking, this is weird, this is crazy. But let me tell you something. It was for the purpose 
that she brought me clothes thinking I needed help. I, um, she didn't know that I, I needed help, but God had an assignment. So when I talk to you about obedience, can we obey the smallest instructions? Is it possible? Is it possible for you, God to tell you, you go to the London, I don't know where, and you stand in front somewhere on a booth? Would you do that? Oh, yeah, I, I, th I think we want to have the details. But how many know sometimes God would never give you details? As they went, as you go, then God gives you more details. This is why I'm coming with about obedience. So obedience to the Holy Spirit, I'm saying that because I know there are business people here who will be contacted supernaturally by people they don't know. And they will be saying, I have been... I have been given you a name by somebody. Don't even act like you don't know that somebody. Because we are talking about obedience here. And this is something I have seen. You know, we have, we have a, a, a lady, she, she told me she was one of the poorest members of our church. And what she used to do is, um, I don't know, maybe Pastor Annie would know her. She, I, she used to make sure that she jumps out of the service before the benediction so she can catch up the bus where she will be able to pay lesser because when the members come out, then the prices were going up. And so I, one time I was preaching, I said, some of you don't wait for benediction. Oops, she stopped. She told me when she went that week, she received a call from South Korea. And she was told, I was given your name that you're very good in business. And I want us to start this week a shipping company together. Today, she is in the business of shipping to... Oh, come on, somebody. Uh, she says, oh, yes, I'm very good in that. So she told me they started with three containers. They went to seven containers in a week. Today, she is one of the richest girls in the church. Come on, somebody. God can open a door. <laughs> hey, you know, sometimes I think God would have a problem in doing some of those things because you want to check them on email, you want to check this, you want to check this, you want to call somebody to confirm something. So I, am, I have also been checking about my own personal testimony, not what people say about me, but what do I know about me? my personal testimony for Jesus Christ. I have also another thing, the eighth thing I want to mention that I have been major, cons uh, which is a major concern to me, is my sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. Am I sensitive to the Holy Spirit? When the Holy Spirit speaks to me uh, and prompt me to do something, do I act or do I wait? Or do I say, let me pray or let me seek God, which are good excuses for Pentecostals. When we don't know what we want to do anything, we also say, let me seek God. Suppose it's the Holy Spirit giving us instructions. So I'm rechecking my standing in this kind of things. So uh, let me make it short. In my, in my conclusion, I discovered I'm still work in progress. Yes, you're looking at somebody who is a work in, the prog in progress. But I was reminded some words from Apostle Paul where he says, I was proved by God to, to be trusted with the gospel. Can God approve somebody and trust you with an assignment? That's my question. I love that when I saw that about Paul. So this 2024, we are building and rebuilding. So when it comes to, to physical buildings and constructions, there's, uh, I want to speak about now nations. I'm about to enter into another, another place and give me permission to enter into that space. There is a huge difference of constru of, of, well, in terms of building between Africa comparing to the West, uh, UK, uh, European countries, there's much difference. You know, not that in Kenya we are bad, but in Kenya you don't find the old buildings like the historical beautiful buildings that you have in the UK. You, our city, you find a very modern city very, very modern city, very high, tall buildings, and, and uh, we thank God for that. But here in the UK, your country is amazing. Allow me to say, I stand to honor your forefathers in faith today, your fathers in Europe, 
I stand to honor every one of them. Because allow me to say to you, the generation today, your forefathers were visionaries. Your forefathers were dreamers. Your forefathers were not lazy people, they were diligent, hardworking people. Your forefathers paid a price for your nations to be where you are at today. These were men and women who loved and feared God and honored God. And I know somebody is about to ask me, how do you know? I know it because of the most beautiful cathedrals that I see everywhere in Europe. They were not built to become apartments. They were built and dedicated to God. So, I also can tell, when I look at these beautiful cathedrals that are many years old, it reminds me something. They had faith put to wax, faith with wax, and that's why they were able to establish such uh, buildings. So when I look at them, I, I'm reminded words, uh, words that are, are, are spoken by John. Your forefathers in these nations, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimonies. And they did not love their own lives even unto death. Stay with me, we are going somewhere. Amen. So for just a moment, when we look, I look at these beautiful, beautiful buildings in Europe, many hundreds of years old, I think about your forefathers. The Holy Spirit, before I came to your country, caused me to think about the forefathers, your forefathers, who did the constructions of the buildings we see today. And that's why I'm drawing your attention. And just to let you know, I, we have an architect here, Pastor Hans. They were not as privileged as we are today. Why? They did not have the modern technology. They, were, they didn't have a dot com. They did not have computers. They did not have the scientific knowledge. They were, they were neither good engineers. They didn't have a degrees like Pastor Hans, masters in this and that and that. They worked manually but they were committed and dedicated people for the cause. So today, we are so graced and so honored with the modern technology when it comes to the machineries. We have very complicated tools, electronics, and you know, we have all the necessary systems, our computer systems, everything is put in place, making it very, very easy to build. When I look at the city of London, it's an amazing city. You have, in United Kingdom, you have very rich heritage. I'm going somewhere. That is why you draw millions of tourists who come to see your beautiful uh, buildings. They come to visit your nation because of what was built, not by you, not even your father, not even your father's father, it goes back to many generations. You have these old, unique, architectural cities and much more so beautiful cathedrals. I marvel at the ancient historical buildings, the castles we see everywhere in the United Kingdom. These kind of buildings are unmatchable with anything that we are seeing in our modern days. In comparison to my opinion, the old looked very good and very beautiful. Allow me to pose a question. In Europe, from United Kingdom, the Psalmist asked a question. If the foundations are destroyed, what shall the righteous do? That is a question that I came to ask you. I know, I know we have, we've been, talk, we've talked about foundations. Europe, United Kingdom, generously guard your nation. Guard the foundation. 
the roots and the foundations of your nation is what will uphold the generations to come. I'm reminded, and I will remind you, your forefathers, they denied themselves everything good to build your cities, to build those beautiful cathedrals, the castles that we see. To build is, a, is hard work, and I thank God that we have passed the hands here. Building is very, very hard work, but guess what? Destroying can take a minute. Just one minute you can bring a building down. You know, Prophet David, I watch how they brought down, you remember the old cowboy, uh, you, these are the Dallas people, you, you remember the, way the, the old cowboy stadium? And they told the whole world to watch. Because I feel like I'm, I'm a part of Texas. I, I quite stayed up to watch. And guess what? I was waiting to see them demolishing it. They sucked it down. Sucking it. Within a second, there was no building. UK, watch out your foundations. Twenty twenty two I spoke on the foundations. We had a we 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 taught, we preached, we did everything about foundations. And just to touch base um, around me to say one thing and uh, and pass the hands if you remember something you can just remind me. Foundation is undercover. Can you see the foundation here at Emmanuel Center? Yeah, we can't see foundations because foundation is hidden under the surface. A foundation uh, never shows off. So a foundation cannot st stand and say, baby, I'm here, praise me today. Because it's under the soil, it is covered in mud and everything. So foundations are deep. Allow me to say one more second thing, that foundations, they carry the weight of every building. What we are sitting at today, I assure you, if it is not of the foundation, will be down bottom. Maybe, I don't know, maybe many meters down. So every weight of any structure is carried by the foundation. So it is about the foundation. So each and everything in this life is built on foundation. Can we talk? For example, families are built on foundations. Nations are built on foundations. Businesses are built on foundations. Any establishment you want to talk to me about is on foundation. Organizations in a foundation. Institution, even a house or a church building, any building is, depends on the foundation. Even men's theories are built on foundation of men's acquired knowledge. Everything about us is about foundation. I think ladies, maybe we understand foundations better because we like putting makeups. What matters in a lady is about her foundation. If she can wear the right foundation, she can match her skin. But what messes us up is when we, okay, that's for a girl's talk. Uh, <laughs> Foundation. Let me not talk about ladies. Ladies, no, 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 no. Mm. A chef, a chef. A prophet Stephen is, 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 is a chef. I know you, you used to bake cakes and, you know, all those kind of things. Uh, I know there is also a foundation to some of these beautiful cakes, which is, stands like a foundation. So, looking at the foundations, foundations in Europe are shaky today. Foundation in Europe have been shaken and shaken. And the foundations in Europe are not only shaken, but they are being pushed and pushed by day. But the psalmist asks, if those foundations are destroyed, what shall the righteous do? Nations are crying in distress. Because the enemy of our souls have robbed us of our young people. Our young people in the West, in Europe, for example, they have walked away from the firm, solid foundations that was laid by their forefathers. Can, can you allow me to talk? They have been drawn and attracted to alcohol, substance like drugs, 
sex perversion, all manner of evil. They have been drawn. They are being sucked from their foundations. They are being removed. They are being wooed by the devil to get out of their foundation. What is a church? What is a cathedral? We're watching families being destroyed in our time by the enemy. But allow me to say, this is not a conference to be nice and pretty. We must be sick and tired to talk the talk. We must change our mind and say we are going to redig the foundations of our fathers and we will build again on them. Oh, Europe, sometimes people don't know if they are boys or girls. You know, I told the Sunday school something. I told our Sunday school in Nairobi, if you want to know if you're a girl, you sit on a toilet. If you're a boy, you stand. <laughs> when you susu. <laughs> you can tell I'm a kindergarten teacher, so it's not a problem. So they don't have to be convinced. They know who they are. There's so much dirt going on. There's too much compromise. Somebody needs to say something. You cannot just sit and be pretty in Europe like nothing is happening. When the devil is robbing you, you are sons. When those cathedrals who are dedicated to the name of God, today, they are apartments. And nobody says anything because everybody wants to stay. Mind your own business. <laughs> You mind your own business, but the day of the Lord comes. The apostles, Prophet David, did not love their own lives even unto death. Somebody must stand up in the UK. Somebody must stand up in Europe. Somebody must be counted. Somebody who becomes like a pastor bonky must become radical enough to preach the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Today, I've come so that we can wage war for your nation. Today, we're going to tell the devil, enough is enough. We're not going to sit and watch our children anymore. We refuse to be telling stories about our children. We'll be telling the story how we overcame. We're not going to tell the stories, oh, oh who is doing what? Who is? You no, know, no, no, no. We have, I have come so that together we can call back our children to the kingdom of God to come back to the foundations of our fathers of faith in God. A price was paid. A price was paid. And I know Dennis, we're going to do this song. I went to the enemy's camp because today we're going to go to the enemy's camp. And we're going to get our children from every chain, every bondage. Today is the day we are waging war. I came in the month of prayer in February so we can pray. And those of you who are pastors, I want you to know they will come with trousers hanging. Even if they come naked, bless in the name of the Lord. Lay hands on them, speak common sense in them and have them baptized with the Holy Ghost. What I say, I'm saying, we are going, we are going for our children. We've got to get our children back to the kingdom. We're bringing our children back to the foundations of our forefathers. These cathedrals were not built to become restaurants. They were built and oil was poured as they were being dedicated to the almighty God. So today, we are going to rebuild the foundations of this nation and the nations in Europe. So today, I want to serve the devil with a notice. <laughs> I've come to serve the, but first of all, 2024, if you agree with me, we're going to sense, to, we're going to experience a paradigm shift. I say the paradigm shift. You'll be missing somebody in the train and tell them, Bode, I sense you need Jesus. And they will ask, how do I get to know Jesus? You say, kneel down right now. Receive Jesus Christ. And you have them filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm calling the old time revival in Europe. I'm saying the old time revival. 
Don't be pretty and nice when you are losing your children by day and by night. We are waiting to see who else the devil is taking. No, no. No, we, we have to be counted on. We have to stand up. You know, we also noticed Kenya, we started going into that way. Oh, there's a special commissioner form for these drugs. No, no, no. We decided to wage war. I'm telling you, our teams, Pastor Anne, sometimes we hear the, the evangelism. They go and surround a small place and they come with a report. 500 souls have come to Jesus Christ. We have radical kids. Is it is her name Faith, the lawyer? Yeah. The one with the, she, she has a huge bag. She, she graduated, she's a miracle baby. Her mother waited for 18 years. The mother didn't have a baby. We prayed and after 18 years, she was conceived. Uh, faith and grace, yeah? Faith and grace, yeah. They are, they are faith and grace. I think faith is the lawyer, the other one is the engineer. Oh my goodness, miracle children. So she has this big bag, like a handbag. She told me, she, when she graduated in the, in the law school, and having succeeded in everything, she told me, Mom, my dream is to be a witness of Jesus Christ. She has a big bag. The bag, Mayor, is full of trucks. Trucks. She tells me when she, she goes in the bus for witness, her call is in the bus, she knows where she's starting. If she's starting with a driver, she sits next to the driver. <laughs> Two minutes, the driver saved spirit field. She moves and takes the back seat. She moves low like that. By the time the bus ends the terminal, she has turned talking people in the bus. I wish today we can get a faith in United Kingdom, in Europe. We need to raise our kids in the ways of God and in the things of the kingdom so we can see this radical faith. She's winning souls. So she gives them track and she tells them what to do, to look for a church. And every person she, who she wins to Christ, she makes sure they speak in tongues. What a call. Amen. We want to see that happening here. Yes. <laughs> we, you, you know, you pastors, you're waiting for people to come from where? Yes. No, let's go for them. Yes. They will not come to church. Yes. They, they don't know church. We have a generation that doesn't, at least in Africa, people know, fear God and they know church. But in Europe, they might think they don't. You go for them. The pubs. Stand at the door if you are not attempting. Uh, okay, no, no. <laughs> if the smell doesn't take you back, stand there, wait for somebody, and tell them I'm here on assignment, and I can sense, you know. You know what? But Prophet David, we need to pray for people to receive the gift of the word of knowledge and discernment. So they can be discerning where people are at. Let me tell you something. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are not medals and a uniform of decoration. It is for work. So that you can know every person. You can tell somebody who's going to waste your time. And you can tell somebody who hasn't had the good news. So you'll be able to handpick and know this one is a kingdom material. This one is a debater. Don't debate with anybody. Because you're not called to be a debater. You're called to be a witness of Jesus Christ. So what am I saying? I'm saying a time has come. I know Pastor Hans' uh, children, they are amazing. They are so winners, even when they come to your city here. And, uh, and, and Pastor Hans, I've, I've been sending you all these things. I, your country, the country that was yeah. almost shut, they are worshiping God at the train stations, yeah. at the bus stop. Have you seen this in Netherlands? And before you know it, we thought people hate God. You see everybody coming, trying to see, and they are stuck up there. How about you in UK? Yeah. Is something going to start somewhere? And here in the UK, like the other day I saw an African lady, I don't know if she was from Kenya or Nigeria or which country, she had a baby on the back, yeah? She, was, she had a microphone, she, the girl was preaching, yeah? I said, that's my type right there. <laughs> that's my type. That is what you call evangelism. So can we agree that it is time for us to rebuild 
on the foundations that were set by the forefathers of this nation. Because if we don't do it, Europe, you are going to skip a generation. You will skip a generation. So we need to build on the foundations of the faith in Christ, which your forefathers were dying to set. So today, the reason I'm here today is so that we can revisit the foundations of this nation. And you and me, we can agree the month of prayer. And you can join us the few remaining Saturdays. Take a day of fasting. Skip a meal. Do something about something. Because desperate people always do desperate things. So do something this season. Skip a meal. Take a fast and prayer. I love the Chapman's family. You know this family is so interesting. Their children, your children take the whole of, is it the whole of January? January and February, those children don't put anything in their mouth from the daybreak until after six. I remember, was it William, when he had a soccer and he had a dislocated a leg and he refused to take medicine because he said, I can't zip water. I have to wait. I'm not talking about, these are the Chapmans, the kids you saw on the stage here. The foundations. Those are the foundations I'm talking about. I think William is in, in a soccer, yeah? A junior in which club is that? Yeah. There it is. And yet, with all the soccer and everything, he will never put zip water in his mouth. Because right now he'll break his fasting after six o'clock. He can they be the same. They're in school. They, they are not even tempted to eat. They came one of the time I was here uh, visiting and they said to me, oh, shush, we don't eat during the day. We don't drink anything. We wait until after six. The foundations are still not broken. Now we can revisit and begin to build on the same foundations. What is happening in their home can happen in every house. Allow me to just say the final thing, then we are done, so we can pray. Why did Nehemiah, why was Nehemiah, the Bible says he was in great distress, and he mourned, and he cried. Why was Nehemiah crying? Why was he so affected by what was the situation of Jerusalem? Please, don't allow your Jerusalem to be broken. To be burnt with fires. <laughs> come on, Europe. Europe. Don't allow the devil to come and burn your cities. Your forefathers have paid a dear price for you to see what you have. So, Nehemiah, one of the things that I notice about Nehemiah, great passion to go and ask the king for permission to go and rebuild Jerusalem. It was for one thing. He wanted to reclaim back the identity and the dignity of his people because of their faith in God. So one of the things God will have you reclaim your cities, it is so that your people can have identity of your foundation. You know, today I would want you to watch uh, the, the speaker was, uh, the speaker of our, of, of today in Femme Family was speaking a very nice message and quite addressed very sensitive issues. He spoke about four countries. At the entry point, you know about their foundations of their faiths. He said, when you enter Dubai, you know. Somali, you know. South Sudan, you know, because it is about their foundations of their faith 
and there's no confusion about it. Are we confused ourselves? Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for I know this is the power of God unto salvation. We must understand our foundations also, so we may stand up for what we believe. So this month of prayer and fasting, please, we are going to have some good time to pray. Europe will be standing with you in prayer. And if you haven't, just log in and see. Our kids are praying scriptures. I, I woke up yesterday, Saturday, yesterday. I woke up to have a little time of prayer. Then I also joined them. My good God, those kids can pray. And they know how to quote the scriptures. They are praying the scriptures. So, if we don't do something, about something. What is Europe? Let the truth be told. What is Europe? It will be sad for us because the gospel of Christ was brought to us in Kenya by missionaries who didn't even know they were lions. They didn't know about mosquitoes, neither did they care. Because they loved not their own lives even unto death. David Rivingstone is marked at his port entry in Mombasa. And though the cathedral was destroyed, the bell has been hanging there. And I think there was a time it was removed, it was ordered by the national whatever to be returned. At the entry point, he preached Christ. The people in the coast did not receive the gospel, so he proceeded on. Where apostle comes from, they, he landed there. And that is where you see the first uh, Lance High School and all that. My grandfather was one of the facilitators in the continent of Africa of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When Karen Brixen came to Kenya, my grandfather was generous enough to accept her. And I thank God, you know, Pastor Jens, I thought something. I met, I think I met somebody, a lady, one lady, and she told me she's the only person remaining in Karen Brickson's family. She was the only single person remaining. And um, the deal, where they were striking the deal, my grandfather and Karen Brickson were striking the deal. You may have watched the movie Out of Africa, yeah? The Paramount Chief is my grandfather where they were striking the deal, God has given me the same land to raise an altar for God. Yeah. Where the negotiations were being done, I have raised. And if you don't know it, check Karen Brickson Museum is at the corner of our church. Stand up, everybody. Pastor Philip, this is the way we're going to do it. Bring a microphone to Pastor Philip and give Pastor Hans a microphone. This is the way we're going to do it. Listen, I said enough is enough. Today, do I have a praying church? How many know the Bible says, says ask? How many people know the Bible says knock? How many know, know the Bible says seek? Today we shall storm. Today we are storming. We are not even knocking and ceremoniously we are going to bump. Let me tell you something. For 15, for 10 minutes, 10 minutes, we're going to do it this way. Gonna, then let's get onto the microphone because we're going to do this song first before we do anything. We're going to stop into the enemy's camp. Yes. <laughs> We're repossessing. Yes. 
Remember, we are, we're doing repossessing, reclaiming. Yes, yes, reoccupying. Oh, yeah, yeah, those words with the reach something. Yeah, that's what we are going to do today.